when I had Lulu, I was already a teacher. Tell us about that. So you were already a teacher. I was already a teacher just for ordinary children. I was teaching in a mainstream school. After all the diagnosis, all the assessments were done. And then I had to wait for the heart because for the heart, they told me it takes time for the hole to close. So not until it closes, that's when we'll give you the final results. Right. Closing, closing, and then it closed finally. Right. Like they said, she's now fine with the heart. So there's no more heart problem in her. That must have felt so good to get good news after all yes of at least i was relieved on that one i was like oh thank god so now i saw how she was growing she was an active child she has been an active child mm -hmm. from birth yes mm -hmm. yeah so i saw how active she was even if she could not see she could not right. see anything i saw how active she was i watched the video you sent me of her yeah. spinning around on the freezer yeah you know she was so active that's when it just came into my mind to say okay i'm a teacher already so let me go and do special education wonderful that's how i went i applied in a university for special education and that's how i did my bachelor of arts in special education mm -hmm. for four years and i remember it was tough to get it because of Lulu's condition right. and then leaving her mm -hmm. and be in the university right. you know it was tough but there's one thing that I like about how life has been because my helper mm -hmm. I've been with my helper for the, the whole 13 years oh wonderful like from the time that Lulu was born yes I'm still with her even right now I'm still with her we are family now right so she knows her very well and she's the one that now started helping me uh, like if I'm out she'll remember remain with her, change the nappies, uh, feed her and you know, all that. Right. So she's the one that helped me. So like even the time when I applied in the university, there were times that would go together to university. Uh -huh. I'm learning and she's with her, maybe like, you know, she's outside, I'm in class and then I'll just come out to breastfeed her, then go back to class. Awesome. Just like that. Right. Yes. Until she was a little bit bigger. When I stopped breastfeeding her, she would remain home with her and then I would go for three weeks and then come back. Yeah, but it was tough. I had um, I had a lot of challenges. It was tough, but then I had to focus because I was thinking that okay, um, if I learn sign language, I think that will help me to communicate. Or if I learn Braille, right? You know, I now started like you know looking for another hope. Right. You know? Yeah, like you know, I started you know telling myself to say okay, I think if I do this. It will help me communicate with her and, you know, all that. I came to accept it. Mm -hmm. When I was told she's blind, she's deaf, it helped me so much uh, to accept when I started school, mm -hmm. when I started doing special education, yes. So, right. like, it, it helped me to reach the acceptance stage right. because there I learned a lot of things. I learned, you know, how children with different disabilities are born and what causes that and, you know. So, like, it started becoming interesting and... It kept my mind busy. And then I had to concentrate on what would be best for my child. Like. Right. But one thing that was worrying me was I was thinking I was the only mother in this world with such a child. Right. You know? Because by then, I never heard of anyone or any child born in that situation. Right. And then, like, the only disabilities I would hear of, you know, somebody would just tell you, okay, blindness, or she was just born with deafness, or handcuffed. It hit me, you know. Like, every time I would think, think I'm the only one with this child, you know, in this world. Because that time, I never met any parents. Though they were there, because they didn't know each other, and, right. you know, all that. At a certain point, when I first stigma from the community. Right. And, you know, here in Africa... Also, we have different beliefs whereby when you have a child who is disabled, there was that, you know, thinking you are, you are cursed. Right. You know, and they would think that maybe you did something or you insulted somebody. Right. They would think that, or maybe there's witchcraft from your family. Right. You know, a lot of, you know, beliefs and you find that you sit here, somebody stands, they don't want to sit with you. Right. Somebody, their child want to play with my child. You find that they take them, they lift them away from her and you know, all that. But that did not check me. That did not stop me from loving Lulu. Right. I said, I'm going to love this child and I'll have to show people that we are equal. Yes. 
we are, there's nothing different. Is She might be blind, she might be deaf, but I had to prove to them to say we are equal. She is worth so like I used to, Yes. So like I used to do nice things for her and I treated her just like a normal child. There was no hiding for me because like, you know, in Africa, it's very common. I don't know if it's common in America to hide children in homes right. or have disabilities. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. Here in Africa, it's so common. Even now, there are still other parents who would hide their children. Right. You find that others, they even hide deaf children. Just deaf. They can see, find that maybe they lock them in the house. They don't want neighbors to see the child. They don't want people to see that they have a child who cannot talk. But like for me, it was a different story. Right. And then I had even to tell everybody to say, I'm proud of Lulu. Lulu was born deaf blind, but I'm proud and I'm going to be her eyes. I'm going to be her ears and I'm going to be her voice. I'll make sure that I just do it the best for her. Yeah. And that was my starting point. So like I never paid attention to any negativity. I never paid attention to any discrimination from the community, from whatever people were trying to do to me. I never paid attention to it. All I could pay attention to was my child. Right. And I could buy different toys. And to find that when you buy toys, my neighbors would even come and say, now you're buying all these things. Is she able to see them? Is she even able to, to know that this is that? So like I would respond to say, yeah, well, as long as it makes her happy, as long as she's able to feel that this is this, even if she doesn't see it, but if she's able to feel it, that this is this, it's doing this, it's spinning, it's doing this, that it's okay for me. And it's okay for her. Okay, how I fought their negativity, yes. So they saw the positive attitude I had. And, you know, that's how I killed that negativity activity in them right. and like they started now praising me and saying you're a wonderful mother oh you're a good mom they now also started like you know showing love to Lulu and you know they would tell their children to say oh can you go and play with Lulu oh Lulu right. Lulu also is just like you and you know because I fought their you know right. and then the other thing that helped me so much was when I was learning you know everything that I learned about blind children and deaf children like when I come back home I was just start observing Lulu so like she was my practical subject Right. I would go to school and, you know, you learn about theory, theory, theory. And then when I come home, she was like my practical. Right. So like, you know, compare the studies and then a practical. You find that she does this. Yeah, she does this. So, you know, it was interesting. And that's how I just accepted to say, okay, she was born like this. Right. It's fine. I cannot reverse it. Yep. And there's nothing that I can do about it. Right. And then I have no choice but to just go on and live a normal life. Exactly. Yeah. That's how I started living my normal life. Like if I'm going to the market, I would carry her. Mm-hmm. Uh, we would go to church. We we'll just do things just in a normal way. But then I was worried because I was like thinking to say, is the second child going to be like Lulu? Right. I had that thought. I went to the hospital. I looked for that doctor and then I had to ask to say, there's something that I forgot to ask when I have my second child. Is the baby going to be the same as this one? So the doctor told me, no, uh, it's going to be different because right. this one, she was born like this because of the disease that you had. Right. So you had that disease. And then what we are going to do is you need to take a test Mm -hmm. for it and then if it's in the immune system if you have it you're going to be vaccinated against it right and then you can conceive right the doctor told me that you make sure that every time before you conceive you do a test right to make sure that's negative and then you can conceive right so i had to go and do a test and then the test was negative but it showed that in the first pregnancy i had it it was there but then when they tested it was not in my immune system so the doctor told me yeah it's because it was passed on to the child so it left you and then it went to the to your child mm. since the results are negative so there's nothing that you can vaccinate uh, against unless the results were positive we're going to vaccinate you so right. you can just go ahead and conceive but like every time you remember to test before you conceive right yeah when lulu was three that's when i think i conceived for another and i had a son wonderful yeah very bouncing baby boy. And he was my okay. brother to Lolo. Yeah, I have three girls and one boy. Oh. Lolo has three siblings. Yes, she yeah. has two sisters and a brother. They are all fine. So that's how the whole thing happened. And then the school thing, I had to transfer because I was in a mainstream school. So I wanted to be in a special school so that it suits with what I was studying in the university. Right. So they had to transfer me now to a special school for deaf children. And then it was nice for me because it was a special school and there were only deaf children 
time. And that's where I started learning sign language. But with Lulu, because when she was growing, that time before I never knew sign language, you know, I was just like, we were just using body contacts and then would communicate using, um, we know when she cries, I would know that she's hungry and, yes. you know, or like she's not feeling well. She cannot talk. Lulu entirely depends on touch. Right. From the time that she was born. So most of the time she uses her hands to communicate to us. Right. And objects. That's what she's been using all her life. Between five and six, I met a friend of mine from Finland. Uh-huh. He came to work to Zambia. He works with deaf blind people in Finland. When he came to Zambia, he was looking for parents with children who have deaf blindness. Wow. Uh-huh. Yeah. I was interested. I was like, oh, wow. Where can I find this person? Yeah. So he gave me the contacts and then I went to meet him. So like we talked the first time. He told me, oh, I'm from Finland. I'm here. I want to meet, you know, deaf blind children. And I was, so I was like, oh, I'm happy. I've got a deaf right. blind child. Right. She's about five. Yes. And then he was also happy. He was like, oh, I would love to see her. Mm-hmm. So that's how we made arrangements. And then he came to my home. Okay. And that's how he met my daughter. So he's the one that told me about tactile signing. He said, oh, children who are born with deaf blindness, they learn through tactile signing. Mm-hmm. So you need to know to talk to her using one hand tactile or two hand tactile. So it was new to me. <laughs> I didn't right. know about tactile signing. Yeah. Right. So he said, I'll, I'll be showing you with time. I'll be showing you. I'm going to work with you for a month before I return to Finland. Mm-hmm. Then we'll see how you are going to be working with her. So he's the one that introduced me to tactile signing and just how to go about it. Uh-huh. So now, like, I had at least some little knowledge on how to communicate with a deaf blind child. He told me you should be paying attention to her body movements, the facial expression, and, you know, all that, the sounds that she's making and, you know, all that. So that really helped me now to know what Lulu wants and to know if she's upset, if she's happy. Has she been successful in learning tactile signing? It has been quite hard, but we are trying. Right. It has been hard, especially that I came to know it later when she was born, when she was a little bit bigger. Uh-huh. And then for me also to implement it, because I didn't know how to, to do it to her. But I'm trying. Every time I try to do things with her, for example, sometimes I would sign, because in Zambian sign language, this is sign for rice, uh-huh. like this. So like if I'm doing it bodily tactile, I just get her finger and then tap like this. Right. The moment we get the rice and put on the plate, I sign to her, like mm-hmm. no time to eat, no rice. Yep. She has started picking some of the signs and there are times that she would sign it. She would not sign direct, but she would sign it somewhere, but. I do pick it to say, okay, right. she's telling me she cannot sign to me rice, but maybe yeah. somewhere she would just like, you know, do yeah. a similar sign. So you could yes. tell that that's what she wanted. That's what she wants. And then I like her because she uses both. She would use the object and she would use the sign. Mm-hmm. So like, even if you miss the sign, you can get it through the object that she has picked. Right. Yes. Which is still so like for rice. Yes. So like for rice, because we cook it in the pan and then if it's on the stove, uh-huh. it is um it's sequential. Sometimes she'll just like go direct where there's a pan of rice and then she'll just pull the pan and put on the table. Right. So that one also helps us to know that this is what she wants. Right. So like she picks on all the objects that we use for her feeding. So yeah, she'll get the rice and bring it over to the table. Yes. So like everything that we've been using, like for the cups, I was talking about the cups. So like for the cups, she's, she's able to differentiate. We use a Maggi cup when we are giving her tea. Uh-huh. And then when we are giving her juicy, we use just ordinary cups. Uh-huh. So she knows she's even able to differentiate. So sometimes if, if she wants tea, she'll just go pick it direct a Maggi cup right. and give it to you. Right. So it signifies, we know that a Maggi cup signifies tea. That's what she and wants. make the tea together. That's what she wants right and then for the juicy it's either she would go to the fridge pick a bottle and put on the table or she'll just get specifically that cup that we use for giving her the juicy right and at least that does help us to uh, communicate with her right i wanted you to tell me about swimming about swimming yes because you shared swimming she loves to swim and that you discovered that (laughs) yes about the swimming thing I discovered this when she was um, when she was just little, I think three, uh-huh. yeah, between three and four years. Uh-huh. So what she used to do, like when I bath her uh-huh. in, a, in a dish, in a small dish, uh-huh. she would still want to remain in the water. Right. Like if you try to pull her, to lift her, and then you, 
you get a towel and then you try to wrap her she would just like you refuse and then she would just she would just hold the dish like this like she doesn't want to come out right yeah right. so i never used to force uh, i would leave her and then i would just add maybe like a little bit of warm water and then let her play so yeah. like you know i was observing to say let me see what makes her right. refuse and be in the water uh-huh. so now i noticed that if she's in the water she would start spinning she would do all the, the back summers in the water uh-huh. and all that so i was like okay i think this is the thing that makes her uh, not to come out of the water right. so like she would just come out when she's tired uh-huh. that's when you see her make some sound and yeah she would be like ah, oh, oh. Right. and then I, I would know that oh she's tired and then like you put her in the in the towel and then you dress her up so that continued and then until she was like about four so I thought now of buying a bigger dish because like uh-huh. you know she was growing and then I thought okay let me buy a bigger dish uh-huh. what I used to do when I put water I would bath her and then the one that I used for bathing her because it would have soap uh-huh. and then it would be white so like what I used to do the, when I'm bathing her and I would prepare another warm water for her so that if I bath her with soap and what, I would pour that water uh-huh. and then clean water right? to avoid her drinking the soapy sure. water and all that. Sure. So like I would pour it and then I would put in clean water uh-huh. and she would just be there now skidding in the water, lifting uh-huh. the legs, you know, doing uh-huh. the water like this uh-huh. and she would just be happy. So I was like, right. okay, for me also, it was nice because she never had friends. Right. So I was like, okay, make water your best friend. Right. And the job that I used to have was just to warm water and pour, warm water and pour, warm mm-hmm. water and pour until she gets tired. Right. Yeah. So that time that the same friend that I mentioned from Finland came, I shared to say, you know, Lulu likes water. Uh-huh. Oh, she likes water. Yes. So what, what what does she do in the water? So I was like, okay, let me just get a dish. You're going to see what she's going to do in the water. So I had to get a big dish and then put her in the dish. She was in the dish and she was playing. So he told me, I think maybe what we can do, let's try to take her to a bigger pool right. and see how she's going to react. That's how we took her to a bigger pool. She reacted that day as if she has been going to a bigger pool for all of That's her time. Amazing. But it was her first time. Right. Yes. It was the first time I had made a swimming costume. Uh-huh. And then we put her in water and then my friend was in front. Then I was also on the other side. And then we just we were just surprised like to see her even do the back row. Right. And she would like dip her even her head in the water, control uh-huh. the breathing, wow. and come up and even do like this and even like you no know, dive again in the water. Wow. It, it was, was as though she'd always known how to swim. Yes. I was so happy to see her do that. And right. uh, until the time came when she the sleeping pattern changed. She was like sleeping so much in the day. Okay, what I discovered was when she has nothing to do, she would be sleeping. She would sleep like the whole day uh-huh. and then she would be active in the night. Right. I'll have to be active as well yeah. and be there for her. Uh-huh. And so like you find that she's active the whole night and then I'll just sit on the chair and then right. maybe you doze a little bit and she'll be right. there jumping and, you know, be on the fridge. At mm-hmm. that time I was living in a very small house. So the house was small and then she knew all the corners of the house. And right. she was like, no, go on the fridge, jump, come down, spin on the fridge. Right. And you can imagine in the night. Yeah. And then she would come to sleep maybe around 4 or 5 a.m. Oh, my goodness. At the same time, I was required also to, to wake up and start preparing, going for work. Right. So, like, it was tiresome for me. It right. Was, it was busy for me. And so now my friend told me to say the only way we can adjust this is to make her busy during the day. That's so we're right. going to be using the swimming activities to make her tired so that in the night she's sleeping. Perfect. So that's how we used to take her to the pool. And mm-hmm. then at the same time, we introduced her to school. So oh, she started okay. school where I teach. And I remember that time also was a little bit hard for us to mm-hmm. take her to school because, you know, she was a child was confined in one place and where she would just walk a few steps and she thought that life is like that you just like move around you Uh know in one area Uh so when we started taking her out and to make her walk a little bit longer distance Mm -hmm. it was hard she never wanted it and she would like no throw herself and she would cry it was difficult and she never even wanted to wear shoes (laughs) 
Right. Like the first time that we took her to school, I had to make her wear some shoes. And then she was just removing. You make her wear the shoes. Immediately you finish tying, she removes and throws them. Right. So my friend was telling me to say, okay, if she's removing them, okay, let's try to see if she can walk barefoot. Mm-hmm. And then she would walk barefoot a little bit. And then she would like, no, start crying. Mm-hmm. just like that yeah so again would force her uh, to wear the shoes still should you know throw them away you know just mm-hmm. like that so my friend told me to say okay we, we are just going to continue we just have to make her understand that see there's wearing shoes mm-hmm. when you're going somewhere right so like every time we're going to school shoes tokens shoes tokens shoes so she started getting used with that until she accepted now wearing the shoes she knew that okay this is wearing shoes when you're right. going somewhere Right. So like the shoes now to her, it became a sign. You right. Know? It's like we developed a sign to say, okay, when I'm wearing shoes, I'm going to school. Yep. Yes. <laughs> it means going. Yeah. So the moment you just get the shoes, if she was sitting, she would even stand. <laughs> yeah. She would know that oh, it's time yes. to, to start walking. <laughs> That's awesome. yeah so it was no fun and yeah i like it but it was hard when we started but then with time she accepted and that's how mm-hmm. she started working long distances and for me i used to feel pity so i used to carry so my friend told me no feelings pity there's no sympathizing here you need to let her walk because when yeah. she grows up are you going to be carrying her on the back mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no mm-hmm. you just let her walk let her know that there's walking. And that's how I stopped carrying on the back. And then we'll just let her walk. So like it used to take her sometimes even two hours. Because sometimes she would walk and sit down. Right. Sometimes she would walk and stand. Sometimes she would even want to go back where we are coming from. Right. Yeah. And to just make her understand, to say, no, we are going this direction. So like it would take us some hours. Right. She had the, the mental traces. Right. She knew now that, okay, we go this side. There's a corner here. There were some things that we made as landmarks for her. Uh-huh. Like if we reached a point where there's a tree, would make her touch, feel touch the tree. tree. Uh-huh. Yes, touch the tree. And then like we continue moving just like that. So wherever we found something that she can touch, we used to make her touch it. Every time when we are getting home, there was a big tree, but a dry one. And then it was near home. So like every time we reached there, we would make her touch it just to give a picture that we are about to right. get home even when she's like no because sometimes she would like get tired and start crying mm-hmm. so just to give us some hope to say okay we are now on this tree right. so very soon we are going to get home yeah and then when we get home we used to there, there was a gate and then there was like no something to push inside and then you open the gate so used to make her touch that thing mm-hmm. for her to know that now we are finally home and immediately she holds that thing. She would even smile and she would just give a facial expression to say, okay, I'm, I'm home now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how the, the school life started. 